want to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Quigley. I'm with DSI, and it's my pleasure to host another Glebal webinar. This is episode number 35, and we appreciate you joining us. We hope that we can gather in person soon at technical conferences or user group meetings. But in the meantime, we'll continue to host our webinar series and in the hopes that these will help us stay connected and informed. It's always great to hear about the community's research, and we're always honored to, that the Glebal can play at least a small part in that work. But in addition to listening to these presentations, I, I do want to encourage all of you to really leverage the Glebal community. I'm obviously very biased here, but I can say with a, a degree of certainty that the Glebal community consists of some of the best metallurgists and materials researchers in the world. So if you're working on, on solving a difficult challenge or have some unique research, and if you're looking for collaborators, uh, please let us know. Uh, our team is often in a really good position where we can help uh, connect you with others that are facing similar challenges. So I really do hope that people can leverage that global community. Today's presenter is Byron MacArthur from the Colorado School of Mines. His presentation is titled Exploring Microstructure Evolution and Mechanical Response of Nickel-Based Superalloys During Isothermal Forging. And I do want to take a, a quick minute here to thank the team at the Advanced Steel Processing and Products Research Center at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, they've been great partners over the years. Uh, they consistently do great work. Uh, a few years ago, they graciously hosted a Glebal user meeting, uh, which was a great opportunity for us all to get together and, and talk, about, uh, talk about our research. Uh, the group also produces a, a steady stream of great research professionals, and they're out there in the world doing innovative and important work, uh, including our own Dr. Brian Allen, who's our chief metallurgist. Uh, but I mentioned the Glebal community earlier. Uh, this is a great example of how that community is able to grow and uh, really spread. Our next webinar is June 3rd, and will feature work by Trevor Ballard, who's also from Colorado School of Mines. His presentation is titled, Double Twist Torsion Testing to Determine the Non-Recrystallization Temperature and Assess Partial Recrystallization. And a link to sign up for that webinar is uh, live on our website right now. Uh, as we've done in the past, today's presenter has pre-recorded his presentation. However, Byron is here with us in the webinar and is able to answer questions during the webinar using the chat feature on the software. So if you have a question, uh, you can go into the chat area and type the question in uh, and uh, Byron will be able to either answer it directly uh, in through the chat or we'll also have uh, some time at the end of the presentation for live Q&A. So we'll take a, a handful of those questions and uh, ask Byron uh, and he'll address them live. Uh, video of this presentation will be available online soon, uh, usually later today we can get it up there. Uh, you'll be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website at Glebal.com and then clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar. Uh, then click on the webinars and you can uh, you view past webinars. There's, there's a lot of them up there at this point, uh, a lot of great information. Uh, as a reminder, the next webinar is June 3rd in two weeks. Uh, but without further delay, I'll hand this over and we'll uh, play this recording. And again, if you do have questions, please let us know. Uh, just go right into the chat area and ask the questions, and our team or Byron will be able to address them live. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Byron MacArthur, and this project that I'll be presenting on is exploring microstructural evolution and mechanical response of nickel-based superalloys during isothermal forging. And this is done under the context of abnormal grain growth occurring as a result of the processing conditions. And Advisors throughout this project have been professors Amy Clark, Kester Clark, as well as Michael Kaufman, and industrial mentors from ATI are Kevin Severs, and from Air Force Research Labs is Eric Payton, and this project has been funded through the Center for Advanced Nonferrous Structural Alloys, or CAMSA. This is an IUCRC that's uh, funded through the NSF, and more information can be found at CAMSA.org. So, an overview of this project is that these alloys are used for turbine disk applications in aerospace as well as land-based systems. And this microstructure generally consists of a disordered FCC matrix phase, the gamma, as well as an ordered L12 phase, a gamma prime. There's oxides and carbides and borides in the material as well, but these are primarily, primarily the ones we're gonna be focusing on is gamma and gamma prime. And the gamma prime exists at various different length scales. Uh, we're gonna call it a primary gamma prime, secondary gamma prime, and tertiary gamma prime. And those are in decreasing order of size from primary gamma prime exists about in the microns, secondary gamma prime is about 50 nanometers. And 
tertiary gamma prime is about 5 to 10 nanometers in diameter. And the thermal mechanical processing and heat treatments that are utilized by industry uh, have been shown to occasionally create abnormal grain growth or abnormally large gamma grains. And the, from an academic perspective, the innovation for this project comes in that this microstructural mechanism is not yet fully understood or even really understood at all as to what is causing this abnormal grain growth. And current work and some review of previous literature has indicated that the primary gamma prime as incoherent plays a significant role in the initial stages of abnormal grain growth of the gamma. And from an industrial perspective of the relevance of this project is that these large gamma grains that are on the order of millimeters in diameter can uh, increase local damage accumulation at high temperature uh, operation conditions and significantly decreases the reliability and the life of the uh, component and we're really trying to understand the mechanisms uh, but what's currently done in industry is they create processing maps of parameters to try to avoid although through complex shapes of the components usually there are some regions that are unavoidable so uh, looking at this on slide three we have a schematic of turbine engines and this is these alloys are typically used in the high pressure turbine section. And this is a disc alloy as opposed to a blade alloy. Um, so here's kind of two schematics and or a schematic in a picture illustrating this. And so for the industrial relevance, as I mentioned a little bit, but to go into a little bit more detail, uh, these nickel based super alloys are used in these turbine di engine discs applications. And these are considered flight critical components, meaning that failure of this component through uh, crack propagation can lead to loss of not only the component and the engine, but also the entire aircraft. So um, reducing the failure of these components is uh, quite important. And as we've discussed, the forging parameters, uh, particularly during isothermal forging, uh, can cause abnormal grain growth and it can occur at various stages throughout the processing. And this is observed not only in this alloy system, but other super alloy systems and materials as well. There's different mechanisms that abnormal grain growth can occur. And we're going to be trying to focus mostly in this material system. So within this alloy and alloy system that we're utilizing, there are two phases that we're mostly going to be talking about. One is the gamma and the other is the gamma prime. Within the gamma, there's uh, predominantly just substitutional strengthening going on. We have uh, various elements such as cobalt and chromium that act as substitutional strengthening elements for this phase. And in the gamma prime, we have here on the right, it's the nickel three aluminum or the L12 structure. And we have uh, nickel at the face center sites and aluminum at the corner sites. There are various elements that can substitute for either the nickel or the aluminum. Uh, oftentimes you may see uh, titanium substituted for the aluminum at those sites. And other alloys uh, that you may observe be familiar with, such as Inconel 718, have gamma double prime, and this is a metastable nickel-3 niobium intermetallic. However, that decomposes at um, higher temperature exposures to delta phase, and this generally provides uh, low to moderate temperature uh, strengthening. And there's R carbides and oxides that are present within the material. Um, previous studies have really shown that this doesn't have a significant effect on the microstructural evolution from the perspective of abnormal grain growth. However, those definitely are present in this material. Um, in the processing conditions that we will be exploring for this, uh, TCPs or topologically closed packed phases are not observed, uh, but they can occur. And these are brittle phases that reduce ductility and also consume a lot of the elements that are used for other desirable strengthening phases. So it has kind of a twofold degradation in life, uh, but we won't really be focusing on this. Just good to know that those do exist. And on the bottom right, we do have one of the kind of micrograph that you may be quite familiar with just in general for super alloys. This is gamma gamma prime example, and this is showing a high lattice perimeter misfit. And that lattice perimeter misfit is really the effect that the uh, substitution and the ordering has on the spacing between the atoms. And so if you have a orientation relationship or a coherent 
uh, secondary gamma primates existing within the material that you have a level of misfit that provides uh, the strength to the material through an elastic strain in the ma material, or you can have loss of coherency once it reaches a certain size or temperature exposure or deformation throughout um, the service or processing conditions within this. For this project, I was provided with two pieces of material. Uh, we have here on the left a low primary gamma prime fraction and on the right a high primary gamma prime fraction. You should note that the these are the same alloys, so the phase fraction net of the gamma prime is the same. It's just a dis different distribution between the fraction that exists as primary gamma prime as versus secondary gamma prime. And on the left here, we have the gamma grains that are existing at about 5 to 20 or so microns in diameter. And we have the primary gamma prime that's on the order of about 3 microns in diameter. And the secondary gamma prime is about 20 to 50 nanometers in diameter. As opposed to the microstructure on the right of the material, we have a higher fraction of primary gamma prime that's about uh, 3 to 5 microns in diameter. And we have a coarser secondary gamma prime that's about 100 plus nanometers in diameter. And the gamma grain size exists nominally smaller, about 5 to 10 microns in diameter. And so the material I'll be focusing on is R1000, so Volus Royce alloy. And this is a gamma gamma prime, as I mentioned. And processing for this, instead of having a uh, cast pro starting condition, we're going through powder metallurgy, and then it undergoes a hip or hot isostatic pressure com compaction, and an extrusion, extrusion or extrusion, extruding at a 5 to 1 ratio. And then there's an isothermal forging that occurs at this uh, near solvus, uh, but still sub solvus temperature, 1035 to 1110 Celsius. Uh, sometimes we, these temperatures may get a little bit hotter. Um, for a lot of my experiments, we start going towards 1110, 1120 Celsius. Um, and I've been recreating this condition with uh, specimens in the Gleeble, as I'll talk about. And after the isothermal forging, there's a super solvus heat treatment. I was performed at 1150 to 1170 Celsius, and I utilized the quench dilatometer for this, mostly for the uh, precise time and temperature control. And here we have, um, on the right plot, we have kind of a phase fraction of the gamma prime versus temperature. And we see that at these lower temperatures, we're really dissolving just the secondary gamma prime. And within this thermal mechanical process in our TMP regime, we're starting to, to dissolve the primary gamma prime. And as we approach the super solvus heat treatment temperature, we have all of the gamma prime dissolved. And through my experiments, as well as uh, exploring literature, some of the critical abnormal grain growth parameters that we've seen have been strain and strain rate during the deformation, as well as heating rate to the super solvus heat treatment, as well and the forging temperature during isothermal forging. So to go into a little bit more detail about isothermal forging, this is done at the sub gamma prime solvus temperature, and this is done at a low strain rate to try to maintain super plastic deformation for decreased forging loads. And nominally, we're trying to have a minimal amount of microstructural evolution occurring um, during this, but there is still some. And at this temperature, the primary gamma prime serves to pin the gamma grains uh, to maintain a small gamma grain size and have super plastic deformation. And that's kind of how it goes about um, continuing that at high temperatures. And nominally, we have a low stored energy accumulation, and this is achieved through having uh, grain boundary sliding or cobalt creep occurring, as well as uh, some levels of dynamic recovery and dynamic recrystallization. And here on the right is a just a picture of a forklift holding a uh, disc forging, and just to kind of illustrate some of the shapes that we're looking at and sizes. And so a schematic for the um, specimen undergoing the thermal mechanical processing uh, in the Gleeble. It's at this high temperature, we have the compression. And uh, then we cool, and then we reheat the material in the dilatometer to the super solvus heat treatment. And this abnormal grain growth is occurring within this uh, temperature regime between either at or between the isothermal forging temperature and the gamma prime solvus. And to look at the microstructural evolution throughout this um, process, 
and the starting condition we have primary and secondary gamma prime distributed within the gamma matrix. Usually all of the primary gamma prime is at the gamma grain boundaries. And so we heat up, dissolve all the secondary gamma prime. The primary gamma prime pins the gamma grain boundaries. We have nominally superplastic deformation. However, you do have some level of stored energy accumulation. We cool the material and then we begin to reheat it in a furnace or a quenched altometer. And we have the level of stored energy here and we have the reprecipitated secondary coherent gamma prime. And we just finally dissolve all of the gamma prime to allow for gamma grain growth. And this gamma grain growth is uh, performed, the step is performed to allow for a larger gamma grain size and uh, improved creep resistance during operation. And then finally, there's a cooling and perhaps an aging treatment afterwards to have a fully coherent secondary gamma prime distributed throughout the gamma matrix. And so an experimental overview of kind of what and why um, we went through. Um, first, we wanted to be able to reproducibly create abnormal grain growth in lab scale equipment. We utilized the Glebel for precise time, temperature, and deformation control during isothermal forging. And we were wanting to uh, control this uh, post-deformation heat treatment, the supersolids heat treatment, uh, in the quenched altometer to try to get uh, precise results and consistency. And then we did quite a large uh, design of experiments matrix uh, through various parameters and we varied these to establish what changes um, in the parameters that we were performing uh, resulted in what changes in the microstructure. And so that kind of gave us some insight into the possible mechanisms and how this is abnormal grain growth is occurring. Additionally, at different steps after isothermal forging or after the quenched deltometer, Supersolves heat treatment, we utilized uh, microscopy, um, light optical scanning, and TEM, um, and as well as diffraction techniques to uh, examine the material processing progression throughout different processing steps. And one of the really interesting and useful techniques was a um, technique in the electron backscatter to look at the uh, distribution of dislocation structure after deformation, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that, as well as we were trying to track the gamma prime dissolution and gamma grain growth during heat treatment. So we tried to have some interesting experiments to do this. And so utilizing these, we were able to kind of iteratively uh, develop hypotheses and test them about what is occurring. Um, as we got further into the project or really started looking at the gamma gamma prime interface and the stability of that during the gamma prime dissolution. And so getting into a bit more detail, utilizing the Glebel for the thermomechanical processing, we have the experimental procedure schematically shown here. Uh, we took a molt or a slice of the uh, RR1000 super alloy and we used a wire EDM to section out samples and then we uh, machine these and to length and parallel faces uh, attached thermocouples and did isothermal forging in the Glebel and you can see here there's three different thermocouple locations we spent a fair amount of time with process development in the Glebel to try to reduce the thermal gradients uh, we were fairly successful in this initial thermal gradients were uh, quite large and this material is extremely sensitive to temperature deviations um, and you, we're operating nominally at about 1100 to 1120 Celsius. And so a uh, 10, 20, 30 Celsius uh, thermal gradient causes a drastic change in the uh, mechanical and microstructural response. Um, so we took a lot of time to try to do process development to get this down consistent and reliable. Um, afterward, uh, we took the specimen and sectioned it into uh, usually six different kind of axially symmetric specimens uh, to do different heat treatments upon the material as well as look at it before and after the supersolves heat treatment. And so a test matrix of things that we were looking at were deformation temperature, deformation strain, deformation strain rate, as well as the supersolves heating rate and supersolves heat treatment temperature. And we explored all of these regimes and there's um, dozens if not hundreds of samples that uh, we went through uh, trying to explore this. And so in a repeatability testing, here is 
a light op etched light optical um, results of the specimen showing very large gamma grain growth into and consuming neighboring gamma grains. Uh, so we were able to not only create abnormal grain growth, but reliably reproduce it in consistent regions of the material. And so this was a very critical step in the project to be able to um, establish a point where we can then work for forward and explore the microstructure and the response to different process and conditions. And so to uh, summarize a lot of the results, um, this abnormal grain growth occurs more extensively as we approach the gamma prime solvus, and it follows kind of these horseshoe bands of the strain and strain rate within the material. And as we decrease the uh, temperature, this shifts the abnormal grain growth to a higher strain regime. And as we decrease the uh, heating rate, I should note the temperature and the heating rate are within the post deformation supersolvus heat treatment. Uh, so that's not during deformation. And so that shifts these regions to a region of higher strain, um, perhaps typical of recrystallization um, they conventionally think of. And this rapid initial gamma grain growth occurs and then to consume neighboring grains that have stored energy. And then once you have such a huge uh, size discrepancy between the neighboring grains and the abnormally large grains, uh, growth kind of cons progresses and you can end up with kind of columnar looking grains in some situations. Um, we have this uh, rare nucleation event of these abnormally large grains and then rapid growth leads to uh, kind of a self-impingement of them upon each other and that determines really the final gamma grain size. That is to say that if you have lower nucleation sites of this that you're going to have a higher final grain size. And so uh, exploring flow stress behavior, we're really looking at um, a set strain. We chose 0.2 strain as this was kind of a critical regime in the context of abnormal grain growth. And so we're looking at um, flow stress as a function of temperature and strain rate. And we were able to see that as we increase the material, um, it, sorry, increase the temperature of the def isothermal forging, we um, observe kind of a decrease in the strain rate sensitivity and there's some anomalous uh, flow stress responses uh, that we observe in this regime over here. And so we'll go into a bit more detail about that. Um, but looking at the strain rate sensitivity, we approach that from multiple different aspects. One is the jump load testing, where you're going through different uh, strains, strain rates and then jumping and looking at the relative uh, flow stress at those once you uh, kind of equilibrate at that point. And um, looking at for multiple samples and having a set strain and comparing those, we we're able to kind of have two different results that achieved or two different experimental procedures that achieved similar results by looking at the slope of the log log of these and plotting that on this. And what was interesting about this is that the strain rate sensitivity, which when you have high strain rate sensitivity, this is an indication of superplastic deformation occurring. And as we approach higher temperatures, that this decrease in strain rate sensitivity. And we believe that this is because as we're approaching the gamma prime solvus, we're dissolving the gamma prime and that we're increasing the gamma grain size. So it's lowering this the propensity for superplastic deformation. And this is interestingly kind of the critical regime for where abnormal grain growth is occurring. And so to look a little bit more in detail about uh, comparing some of the different strains, sorry, strain rates and temperatures, um, in this plot we have here on the right, we have a, on the top here is 10 to negative two strain rate, uh, sorry, per second. And we have these lower uh, flow stress behaviors here at different temperatures. And what was interesting is that while flow stress is significantly dependent upon the strain rate of the isothermal forging, there's some interesting behaviors within, with response to temperature. And that we have here in the black is 1120 Celsius and one time 10 to the negative three per second. And if we decrease the temperature, uh, we actually have a decrease in flow stress, and this is uh, likely due to the superplastic deformation with an increased uh, gamma prime uh, fraction. And this is that's the cause of it. And kind of to support this, if we had a, a preheat treatment to further dissolve the gamma prime, but then 
deform the material at a lower temperature, such as we did with the pink or purple line here, 1120C preheat and 1110, sorry, 1100 deformation at this low strain rate, then we have the highest flow stress of them all. And this is corroborated by this increase in average grain size here at 10 and negative uh, 3 versus 10 and negative 2 per second. Um, there's a secondary or a bimodal grain size distribution. So there's 10, 10 and negative 3. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that uh, later on. And so stored energy uh, within the microstructure, and we're going to kind of go through and uh, just describe the evaluation technique we utilized for this. Um, so this is stored energy in the form of dislocations, and we're evaluating this as a driving force for recrystallization. And these dislocations can really be considered from two perspectives. One is the geometrically necessary dislocations, as well as the statistically short dislocations. And the geometrically necessary dislocations uh, cause misorientations in the lattice structure within the grain. And statistically stored dislocations are um, kind of opposite sign, and they cancel each other out. Typically, for characterization techniques, GNDs can be evaluated use, utilizing uh, electron backscatter diffraction, and uh, SSDs can be evaluated using XRD. Um, we wanted kind of a spatially resolved technique, uh, so we used the EBSD mapping. And so we were looking at GNDs. We are kind of, in some sense, ignoring SSDs. But the assumption being made here is that if you have dislocations, um, you're not going to have too much of a discrepancy in distribution between these two. And so utilizing scanning electron microscopy and the electron backscatter diffraction, um, this maps the orientation of the material by sampling each voxel or pixel of the material. And then it does um, some analysis to determine which grains are, or which grain that pixel belongs to, and it kind of um, plots those grains on a map. And with this information, uh, using a grain reference orientation deviation, um, kind of a mouthful there, but a GROD technique, so I'll call it, this maps out each pixel's misorientation relative to the average orientation in the containing grain that it just calculated. Uh, that it is, exists within. And this is good for the uh, qualitative, not a quantitative, evaluation of stored energy or in the form of dislocations in material. Um, I'm not really mentioning that grain boundaries are a sense of stored energy, that they're non-equilibrium. So that in and of itself is a driving force. Um, but we're mostly focused here on dislocation density as in the context of isothermal forging. And so within the microstructure, and as deformed state, um, as if we start, if we took this material and did a super solvent heat treatment in the right conditions or wrong, depending upon your perspective, uh, this would create abnormal grain growth, um, as we demonstrated in many different specimens. Um, but in the as deformed state, the stored energy distribution within this was quite in interesting. Um, that we have really three distributions of gamma grains, and one is that we have quite small gamma grains with low levels of stored energy uh, distributed throughout here. And we have these, uh, secondly, we have medium grains that have a level of recovered dislocation content. And I'm calling it recovered because there seems to be kind of dislocation cells, especially near the grain boundaries of the material. And uh, there are some limitations to the GROD technique. Uh, sometimes it misidentifies low angle grain boundaries as being a large amount of dislocations, um, but I'm going to skip over that for now. Um, and finally, for third, we have uh, large recrystallized grains that have grown to consume neighboring uh, grains of stored en energy. And we have mo many of these throughout, distributed throughout the material in this situation, like here, here, and in some instances uh, have yet to grow uh, very large within there. And so here is a animated GIF of the material, GIF, GIF. Um, and this is uh, looking at the driving force for abnormal grain growth. And um, this was processed in the conditions for um, thermal mechanical processing that would create abnormal grain growth. And I did interrupt the heat treatments within a quenched automer that was backfilled with UHP argon and then pulled down to 10, 10 to negative 6 torr vacuum. 
and then after that it was um, slightly polished with 0.02 micron colloidal silica by hand to, so to remove a minimal amount of oxide on the material that formed during heat treatments and so here it's progressing through um, the as deformed state and 1110, 1130, 1150, and 1170 Celsius uh, to kind of track the abnormal grain growth that's occurring. And we have grains A and B here that grow to consume neighboring grains. And you have these island grains that are uh, within the material, but those are eventually consumed at higher temperatures. And so really what we're interested in, we've seen the growth stages of abnormal grain growth, and we're kind of trying to get a grasp, but how is this initiating? What's the initiation of this um, recrystallization nuclei? Um, and this, we've been demonstrated to occur rapidly at these temperatures, uh, specifically between the isothermal forging temperature and the gamma prime solvents. And we've demonstrated through various experiments that this can occur through dynamic, post-dynamic, or static recrystallization, though the differences between post-dynamic or metadynamic, as some call it, um, and static recrystallization is really kind of semantics. Um, there's not too much in terms of mechanisms there that are different, uh, but I'm just listing those three out for clarity. And as has been de demonstrated to occur at low levels of stored energy that are required to initiate. Uh, and so it appears that there's a different mechanism rather than traditional recrystallization that's occurring here. And so this is what we're trying to explore. And this, whatever mechanism is occurring, it seems to be a, a site availability limited recrystallization. And this is what causes this abnormally large grain, gamma grain growth or gamma grain size. And so one of the mechanisms that we've been evaluating as a possible cause for this uh, was originally disregarded by the, the founding or finding authors of it, uh, Sharpine and uh, Bozolo's group as being responsible for abnormal grain growth. Um, they discovered this heteroepitaxial recrystallization. Essentially, it's a coherent or co-oriented gamma forming off of a gamma prime. Um, and there's a lot of, there's several different theories about how this is occurring, but it's quite interesting regardless. And um, it exhibits an exceptionally low energy barrier for nucleation. And what is occurring really at this interface is kind of what we're going to try to explore here. And so one of the proposed theories about kind of how the microstructure is evolving here and how this is going about is that this high temperature uh, deformation is decreasing the primary gamma prime presence and this is really reducing the site availability for this recrystallization size sites, uh, number of sites, and that we have a larger final gamma grain size and this is in theory quite consistent with it as well as experimentally what we've been observing and this dynamically evolving microstructure that's occurring throughout deformation as we saw with the three grain size or sorry grain group distribution of stored energy and sizes uh, creates this really heterogeneous distribution of stored energy uh, for of the, that results in the driving force for recrystallization and grain growth and this time at temperature between the deformation and the Solvus are the critical parameters uh, for abnormal grain growth. And so going to a little bit more detail about uh, the coherent or coherent gamma recrystallization uh, through the heteroepitaxial recrystallization technique or mechanism that Sharpine has discussed is if we look at here in kind of a schematic, we have a primary gamma prime that's incoherent and existing at gamma grain boundaries. And if the gamma grains have a certain level of stored energy, in a certain misorientation angle and that during heat treatment you may have a templating mechanism that is the gamma forming co-oriented with the primary gamma prime and that could grow to consume the neighboring gamma grains. Alternatively, uh, what we've also observed is a disrupted interface at the primary gamma prime and this could occur during the dissolution of the primary gamma prime as we are in this temperature regime and the stability of that gamma uh, forming there would be of interest. And in either of these cases, though neither are mutually exclusive of the other, they are both definitely possible, it appears. Uh, this would result in uh, grain growth of the gamma nuclei that uh, formed and is co-oriented with the primary gamma prime to grow to consume neighboring gamma grains of stored energy. 
And so one of the things that we're looking at is if you have a primary gamma prime that is dissolving, uh, you'd expect the uh, neighboring gamma grain to grow to consume that region that is dissolving. However, uh, that may not be what we what is occurring, and we've seen some evidence of the contrary. And so what we've been looking at is to try to evaluate the stability of the shell as we dissolve the primary gamma prime. And so we're heating to partially dissolve this and then quenching to try to freeze the microstructure and investigate if this gamma shelling is uh, stable. And then subsequently, uh, we're looking at, at determining if this gamma shell it, is stable without any driving force for growth and if it would likely stay there at extended heat treatments. So initially what we were looking at was taking a material such as um, what I'm calling S1 or the slice one uh, that we received that was, a, was labeled and this didn't exhibit any initial shelling so we wanted to expose this to an increasing temperature and then perform a quenching operation to see if the shelling is stable. And here we have a high magnification EBSD micrograph of the region. And if we overlay the uh, SEM of uh, back, backscatter on this, or sorry, uh, secondary image, electron imaging, we see this region here that is the primary gamma prime, and we have this adjacent gamma that has formed from the dissolution of the primary gamma prime. And this exists in this region as well. And we'll show here particularly right here and as well right here. And so, uh, and the second example here, we have this region right there as well and right here. And I should note that the EBSD technique really does not, is not able to distinguish between the gamma and gamma prime. So right now we're kind of going based upon morphology and topology of the, sorry, topography of the material um, in that kind of an mechanically etched micro microstructure that we're seeing here. And so we have this region right here and right here as well. So to be able to show a little bit better in terms of distinguishing between the gamma and gamma prime that the EBSD was not capable of, um, we have a TM micrograph here with a selected area diffraction patterns uh, for these two corresponding regions. And we have the primary gamma prime here and then this is an incoherent green boundary kind of going along through here, right there. And this is a co-oriented gamma gamma boundary, sorry, gamma gamma prime boundary. And we have the SAD patterns with uh, super latched reflections within the gamma prime here showing this is indeed the ordered structure as well as the absence of these super latched reflections within the same orientation of, of the SAD pattern uh, showing that these are co-oriented with each other, and this is likely occurring as a result of the dissolution, dissolution of the primary gamma prime to form the stable gamma uh, that is occurring at this prior region that was previously uh, prim primary gamma prime. So since we're able to demonstrate that the dissolution of the primary gamma prime is able to form a relatively stable gamma shell or neighboring co-oriented gamma region, uh, we were trying to establish is this gamma shell that's forming as a result of the dissolution of this primary gamma prime stable. So we took a region with extensive initial shelling that already existed and we did a high temperature exposure for a long time hold uh, to allow for an attempt to reach an equilibrium condition to see if this um, gamma shelling that is occurring is really indeed stable. And we did some high temperature heat treatments at two hours at 1100 Celsius to try to allow for the material to approach an equilibrium state and for kind of consumption of that shell by either uh, the neighboring grains, gamma grains, or, or whichever mechanism would occur. However, we still observed a fair amount of uh, stability of that shelling in multiple regions uh, within the material. and. Uh, so now that we've established the effects of dissolution of, of the primary gamma prime to incur a stable gamma shell that's co-oriented with the primary gamma prime, one of the effects that we're looking at is and interested in is uh, deformation at these high temperatures. And we have here three different micrographs showing various strain rates. And this is kind of two different contributions here. One is time at temperature for 
the evolution of the primary gamma prime and the other is the uh, obviously the strain rate here. So we have on the left a very high strain rate uh, too. We have relatively little evolution of the primary gamma prime. However, at a decrease in strain rate, we have a very disrupted interface of the primary gamma prime. We have this shelling that's occurring still uh, at the expense of the primary gamma prime. And at ex even longer time at temperature or at lower strain rates with extended deformation, we have this lower phase fraction of the primary gamma prime. And this is believed to be because we're essentially disrupting the interface with the primary gamma prime enough that we're um, obliterating it in some sense. And this is really driven by the what we believe to be the dislocation structure within the primary gamma prime. And we can also have gamma boundary movement uh, kind of through these primary gamma prime through a discontinuous reprecipitation mechanism that we're currently exploring. And so here's a IPF or inverse pole figure map overlay over the region showing this is all with the same orientation. And this one as well here. So in conclusion, the gamma primary gamma prime microstructure is undergoing constant evolution during this high temperature thermomechanical processing and the subsequent supersolves heat treatment. And literature is kind of lacking on the primary gamma prime results showing evolution at these high temperatures and during thermomechanical processing. It's kind of treated really as more of a static feature of the microstructure that only changes during dissolution and not in the way of incurring a stable oriented gamma shell. Uh, and dynamic recrystallization, superplasticity uh, during the isothermal forging creates a unique microstructure um, and interesting mechanical responses at different strain rates and temperatures, uh, perhaps inverse of what we may initially think. Uh, and the formation of the stable oriented and strain-free gamma shell at these primary gamma prime interfaces appears to be the mechanism for lower energy recrystallization, sorry, I should say lower energy barrier to recrystallization that leads to abnormal grain rates because we're having very few of these nucleation sites occurring. And these eventually grow to be very large grains that self impinge upon each other once all of the stored energy has been consumed and we have very few large gamma grains with low amounts of uh, green boundary energy or storage energy in the form of dislocation density left in the material. And by utilizing the Gleeble equipment, uh, we've been allowed for relatively precise control of temperature and the deformation steps while providing an output load data during displacement controlled isothermal foraging. And this has been really helpful for understanding the mechanical response of the material at this isothermal foraging steps. So I'll stop here for any questions, and I'd like to thank you for your time for this, watching this presentation. Um, my name is Barton MacArthur, and my email is listed here, and I'm a current student at Colorado School of Mines, just finishing up my PhD. Great. Uh, Byron, great presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to not only make the presentation, uh, do the work that goes into it, but then also sharing with us. Uh, we appreciate it. We do have a few minutes left for Q&A. Uh, Byron, if you can... Take yourself off mute. We can okay. confirm that. Can be there. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. So great. Uh, you. you did a great job uh, answering questions during uh, the presentation. Thank you for that. You were typing uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we had a number of uh, really good questions. I guess I'll, I'll start by maybe asking you to. Um, it's always difficult to give a full answer in a in a chat. So are there any maybe those kind of initial questions that you? You'd want to expand on a little bit and uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, I I think I hopefully addressed them in the um, chat well enough. But I, I suppose with the processing for the material, usually the high higher strain rate uh, extrusion processing that creates the incoherent primary gamma prime that's on the order of a couple microns. Um, that's done. I mean, there's various uh, a range that that can be done at both in temperature and strain rate. Um, that achieves kind of a your distribution that you're starting with of uh, primary gamma prime and secondary gamma prime and the respective sizes of those. Um, during the subsequent isothermal foraging that they do, uh, you have the dissolution at that temperature about 1100 Celsius or so, plus or minus um, 
10 or 20 Celsius, you're having all of the secondary gamma prime dissolved and you're doing deformation um, at lower strainers to try to have a relatively superplastic deformation. So they're not having too much, um, I, I suppose, dislocation or um, accumulation within the gamma. And then they're able to achieve that by having the primary gamma prime existing still at that point to pin all of the gamma boundaries. And then you, after that isothermal forging, you cool and then that reprecipitates the secondary gamma prime. And then you then reheat to get to the final microstructure that you're trying to achieve. And during that reheat is when, depending on the prior processing, abnormal grain growth can occur. And that reheating, uh, you're dissolving those reprecipitated secondary gamma prime as well as those primary gamma primes that you had still for the isothermal forging. And then you're getting to above the gamma prime solvus where you just have them um, gamma grains. And you have nominal growth of those to about 50 to 100 microns um, for prior temperature um, mechanical properties during service. And then there may be some subsequent um, subsolvus aging after that point, but um, usually that's kind of that uh, locks in microstructure at that point. But, um, and I suppose to try to address some of these later questions uh, by Dr. Kumar um, that I didn't quite get to in the chat, um, strain varying across uh, cross section. I, I, I definitely agree with those kind of complex morphologies that you may see um, in those disks. Um, in the kind of near net shape in, in some sense, that there's definitely going to be a significant strain, strain and strain, corresponding strain at gradient across those. Um, I'm not, I haven't, I don't have too much experience with that, um, those kind of final ingot and final uh, component product um, forging conditions, so I'm not quite familiar entirely with what those strains and strain rates were. I, I know strain is not su Super important. It's more dependent upon the strain rate that the material is locally receiving during, especially those initial stages. And from what I've seen, it does appear that um, there is that these strains and strain rates achieved at these temperatures when you do have abnormal grain growth in service conditions. Um, and from the feedback that I've received from um, kind of industry um, processors that do this for actual components as well as. Uh, kind of DOD, DOE, or sorry, DOD um, it, advisors that it's just kind of within that regime um, that they're observing this as well. And liter uh, kind of published literature that's more open source than that um, seems to support that as well. Um, for Brian Allen's question about um, connection between superplasticity and uh, that transition and abnormal green growth, I yeah, I think in this temperature regime, you're having this uh, partial dissolution of some of the primary gamma prime, and this is how you get this kind of, I wouldn't say bimodal, but you're getting a grain size distribution of the gamma, and this leads to kind of this, partially leads to some of this inhomogeneous uh, stored energy distribution within the material. Um, and so actually, if you can just maybe read, there's a, you see, I think you can see the list of questions there. So yeah. uh, if you want to just yeah. maybe read the question. And then address it, but this is great. Oh, okay, sure. Um, for explaining how HRX is different from uh, PSN particle simulated nucleation, um, that was actually one of the things that we had considered very early on in this project. Um, one, of the, one of the main aspects of how uh, HRX and kind of this PSN deviation is, um, aside from th there's the mechanistic um, difference between how that nucleation and recrystallization occurs. Um, but particle stimulated nucleation is usually because you have oxides or carbides or um, particles within uh, intragranularly um, within the sorry with, within each of the matrix grains, and so you have dislocations uh, kind of passing by, passing through um, that region. So in that in particle simulation, you're having that local accumulation of um, higher density of dislocation structure, um, and you also have that incoherent. Um, boundary at that boundary of that uh, particle. And in this case, um, oh, sorry, uh, I guess in that case, that's where you'd have the higher density, higher driving force and site availability for recrystallization, as opposed to HRX, the primary gamma primes are predominantly existing at the gamma grain boundaries. Um, so you're not having dislocation kind of looping or um, or one looping in, in that sense. Um, and the HRX here, uh, not so much having the formation of a um, 
boundary off of an incoherent interface you're having kind of this co-oriented or uh, coherent um perhaps to start but really i'm going to use the term co-oriented because i'm not quite 100 percent sure on the orientation yet or sorry coherency you have to go into quite a bit more in detail on uh experimental um I guess the characterization of that, but uh, co-oriented on that um, gamma prime as you're dissolving it, or if you're having some dislocation interactions in, internally uh, that cause that HRX mechanism. So it, it is definitely a distinct mechanism from PSN. Um, uh, full stretch, uh, the next question by uh, Lu, Lu Chao Lu, um, can you get full strain and stress curves after your global compression test? Um, I, Yes, the, um, the, the critical stresses for abnormal grain growth really to kind of initiate either dynamically or, or statically afterwards um, are relatively low. They're about um, 0.15 strain. Uh, and so you, you can do continued deformation afterwards, but it, in this abnormal grain growth conditions, it's really kind of this early on condition and we're doing a compression test as opposed to a tensile test in this situation. So you don't have that in, um, end final fracture. Um, and before deformation um, for um, uh, Srinivas uh, Kumar's question, um, the hold time for the sample. So we'd evaluated different hold times um, in the, utilizing the global to make sure that we were kind of at a equilibrium state um, for the primary gamma prime uh, fraction. And we held for several minutes. Um, we, I'd initially held only kind of at one minute to see if that was sufficient. Um, I was having some issues in the um, global early on kind of during that uh, process development stage before really getting a consistent um, technique down. Um, but I, I was, I did go out several minutes um, of a hold time for those samples to make sure that I did have that um, relatively um, stagnant or static uh, microstructure prior to deformation. And for um, uh, Vinod Kumar's uh, question, or he had one comment about, um, sorry, I'm just reading this right now. Um, I, I think, oh, okay, so his comment is kind of saying that academic studies really are looking at these low strain rates uh, for DRX and possibly for abnormal green growth. I would think he's mentioning um, and industrial practice um, really has this higher strain rates. Yep. Um, so perhaps that would be something that could be looked into into future work. I, I, sh I will note that um, while most of my work in the early on was done about 10 and negative three uh, per second, there was definitely strain rates that I was able to achieve abnormal grain growth with um, about 10 and negative two per second. Um, I, I think anything faster than that, we really weren't seeing abnormal grain growth. I, I think. Uh, I guess to reiterate my point earlier of, I, I think locally within microstructures, this abnormal grain growth is kind of inconsistently occurring sometimes um, based on uh, differences in processing um, conditions. But there, this does seem to be kind of consistent from what I've seen and heard um, from industry. But if you have other input or information on that, I'd definitely be interested in hearing about it. So. Byron, th thanks very much. This is a uh... Also, thanks, you, you, you were able to kind of walk through all those questions, made my job really easy. So, uh, appreciate the, the input. I think we are, we're just about out of time here. So, uh, again, I wanna thank you for, for doing the presentation, answering questions, uh, do a lot of work this morning. It's, I know it's a bit early out there. Uh, so, appreciate your time. And again, uh, great presentation from, from you and uh, from, you know, I know your team at Colorado School of Mines, again, has been great uh, for DSI. So, we appreciate that as well. Uh, if, I know you did put your email address up there earlier, but if anybody uh, would like to reach out uh, and connect with Byron uh, or his team, uh, please uh, you, can, you can email me uh, for sure, or anyone at DSI, and we can help make that connection. Uh, so if you'd like to maybe uh, discuss a little bit more, uh, looks like you are getting some good feedback. So uh, we're happy to make that connection. Uh, if anybody out there has uh, technical questions about their Gleebel, uh, do reach out to our service team or anybody at DSI. Uh, I mentioned this every webinar, uh, but we do have a service portal that includes a, a knowledge base. Uh, it's a very convenient ticketing system as well. So if you do have an issue, uh, you can create a ticket. Uh, eventually our guys will be out on the road. 
Uh, so the ticketing system is really the best way to, to get support because if you email someone directly, they may be on an airplane or uh, on site somewhere and not, not available. So uh, create a ticket. Uh, there is also that knowledge base. Uh, you may be able to get some self-help as well. Uh, if you have any questions about how Gleeble can support your research, uh, please email me and I can connect you with an application expert uh, to help you find the right solution. Uh, my email address, I think everyone has it, uh, it's in the invite, but it's dan.quigley at gleeble.com. Uh, and one more time, I will say to you that I mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, the Gleeble community, you know, if you do have a, a challenge out there and, and you need, you're looking for collaborators, you know, let us know, we can help you make the, those connections also. Uh, so again, Byron, thank you. Uh, and I want to thank everyone else for joining us. And again, uh, I do hope people that do stay safe. Uh, we'll continue to have these webinars so we, we can stay connected, but uh, most importantly, that everybody uh, stays safe and healthy. Uh, and with that, we'll, we'll end it. Uh, Byron, thanks again.